couple of big shifts in the industry, um, which lead us to this journey now. The first is the explosion of social data. Think about it. The journey is really only 10 years old. And look at all the changes we've had. We've gone from monitoring the buzz and just seeing how many mentions there are to looking at um, the metrics around it and then moving into real time. And that shift, let's see, we're getting closer. Nope, no, we're not. Good, I'm going to go without it. So that shift has really led us into the way that companies are using social media has changed drastically. Um, what we're seeing now is a trend where it's really being integrated into the entire enterprise. The old model was having a silo. Uh, social media was there. They were reporting backwards. Now it's about using those insights across the business and looking in real time. And the second shift we've seen is um, the world of the, the, the digital revolution. And in that shift, we've seen a different way that companies are making decisions. Historically, it was all about making the best decision. But now, the amount of data is more, um, there is faster speed, and customers want more. They want an emotionally engaging, aspirational experience for their brands. And so what we look for is actually having uh, decisions that are good, that we can adjust even faster to. And that's the agility that we talk about. That's what we're seeing in terms of the speed at which things are working. So when we talk about um, changes in the industry, I think there's, there's three main things that stand out for me. The first, as I said, is how this data is integrated across the enterprise, because no longer is it one piece of information. It's how we disseminate that across all different departments and teams. Um, the second thing is that largely most of the data that social media providers will give you is the same. You know, social media analytics companies is the same. So how do you win with that? I think there's a big thing in, in product innovation. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the latest Forrester report, um, a lot of companies slid backwards. And it's not because their platforms got worse, but it's, it's the expectations of where social media listening platforms should be has risen so much. What we as companies and, and as agencies can be doing with insights. And so that's a big takeaway. And the third one is the ability to win on strategy. Um, again, if all the data is the same, how do you win? It's on strategy. So there's, there's a couple of key takeaways there. The first is, how can you get um, data you can trust? Is it complete and is it accurate? Is it, is it a full set of data that we can rely on? Uh, the second thing is the speed to insights. Um, it's not just about the platform. It's about the people, the processes, the purpose, and the goals that you have internally, and all those elements coming together to create a social media platform. So if we think about um, in that aspect, it's not about uh, can I get to the results? You know, the, the best social analysts can use pivot tables and linear regressions and whatever you do uh, to, get, to get to those results. The question is, can I do that quickly? Does it take me two days or two hours? And that's a big differentiator. And the last part is the human element. Not just looking at a post and saying, is it positive or negative, with a varying degree of accuracy, but can I understand the emotional drivers, the behaviors that people are talking about? Are they saying the passion intensity? How strongly do they feel about something? And so that's how we view social, is, is giving it a more human element, a faster um, speed to insight, and then ultimately um, rooted in strong accuracy and completeness. So with that, um, I'd like to, to open up to the panel now. Um, we've got a, a series of questions that really explore that, that interplay between uh, real-time insights and, and agility. So, um, you know, as I said, we've seen that shift from historical reporting into the, the real-time social analytics. So how have you used social analytics to help manage and actually grow your brands? Charlie, you want to start? Uh, yeah, I'd say as is viewing it in a competitor context. So it's kind of how is Lloyd's doing, but without knowing like what is the competitor set average on any metric, be it sentiment, passion, volume. It helps contextualize that, right? So this is a baseline. This is where we should be. And then using things like beats, anything from like emoji analysis to influencers or multiple different metrics. Where is that peak or trough in sentiment coming from? Mm -hmm. And how can we take action against it to either, either neutralize the negativity or maximize the positivity? Time machine are a very competitive industry in yeah. uh, <laughs> mobile phone devices. Yeah. How about you? how about for you? So we probably will never stop using historical reporting. Obviously, like it's important to see 
um, trends versus competitors, you know, how you did against previous phones or, or the other products. But we're definitely moving more towards real-time analytics, and it's mainly with product launches. So, you know, now there's a lot more interest in campaigns and the product launches themselves. And, um, you know, people are always asking for data, which is good in a way. Um, lots more work to do, but um, it's, it's important to just keep on, on top of it. Mm -hmm. And Rima, for yourself, L'Oreal, there's always a, <laughs> a lot going on there. Yeah, so I think for us in the beauty space, obviously, there's so much conversation happening around new product launches, our brands, new trends. So for us, it's really using the historical data to understand growth in the space and how we fare against our competitors, but also using the real-time data to understand our consumer. And I think what social media analytics in real-time allows is for you to really connect with your customer. You're moving away from thinking about what they once said to actually what are they saying now, what do they want from us, how can we be agile to meet their needs. So um, it, it's, it's the huge benefit of being able to see what they're saying in real time. What about influencers? That's something that I know as everyone's talking about right now. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that? Can I talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, so I think it, the influencer presentation that we had earlier was really, really interesting. And one of the biggest takeaways for me, and which it, you know, it just goes to show how much we're continuously learning in this space, um, was that we'll, there's so much room to understand the comments around what people are saying in the influencer pieces of content that they're publishing for our brand. So, you know, it's easy for us to be able to track mentions with certain um, tech that we to, that we bring on board, but. NetBase could actually allow us to look at the comments to understand the sentiment and whether or not people are excited to see the influencer wearing our mascara or whether they're excited to see her new nose ring. So it's things like that mm -hmm. that it will allow us to give us more insights. Okay. And Madame Deepa, we'll come to you now. So how have you used social analytics um, to really unlock those deeper insights, those better insights about your customers and your competitive landscape? Um, I think it's important to look at social data with a wide range of lenses. So not just looking at like number of people talking about it or number of mentions, but more into like sentiment and passion, which NetBase helps us to do. And also things like emojis and mm. um, like logo recognition and those sort of like new ways of analyzing data. And I think that that really like helps us to understand what really people are talking about. Um, whether that's about our brand, our campaign, our products, I think it definitely helps us to understand things from um, in, in, in basically in a different way rather than just looking at how it is. So yeah. I think that in, in that way, I think it's quite interesting to uh, analyze social data and understand whether that's about customers, about brand, and you know, it, it gives a deeper insight. Mm -hmm. Any deeper insights down here that you think uh, the audience would love to hear? Um, we've, so we've looked at um, our own strengths and we're trying to sort of promote those obviously as you're, if you're not that well known in some markets you need to, well, increase your brand awareness basically. So we've used social insights to see what are people talking about in terms of mobile phones, uh, what do they really like about what they have and what do they wish was done differently. So we discovered that um, a lot of people who use competitor handsets felt battery life was, a, was an issue, mm -hmm. so that it wouldn't last a whole day or whatever they were saying. So that's one of the strengths of Huawei phones is that the battery seems to last forever. So um, we, we did a couple events where we did things like um, in Australia by the beach, there was a, a phone charging station. You'd come there, charge your phone. At the end, it would show that it was one of our phones powering your phone, sort of giving you a recharge. Um, there was something in the Netherlands as well where outside an Apple store people were lining up all night so that the batteries wouldn't last so we gave them a, a charging station as well again just to sort of push the idea that that Huawei batteries are very strong and you know give you give you sort of uh, the stamina to last longer as it were for mobile phones and um, yeah so we found that quite effective and it's helped us to sell a lot more phones so learning these kind of insights has helped Huawei to um, increased sales throughout the whole world, so we're now number two in terms of handset volumes, which is pretty pretty good. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I guess just to stay, stay with you as you pivot now, so getting away from maybe the data itself and, and talking about how we can use this across the enterprise, um, 
What are some of the, the challenges and opportunities that you've seen as you've looked to integrate this across the, the business? And, and where do you see this really, you know, some of the changes you've seen the past two years um, with social media from, as I said, going from a silo to really becoming more of a, you know, everyone needs this data now? Um, within, within Huawei, it's definitely become more important. So I remember when I first started about two years ago, there wasn't that much reporting or there'd just be sort of one covering global. And I remember sending my report out and then um, to China, basically. So my, the, the head of marketing insights was in China presenting to senior leadership. And someone in the London office showed me a photo from that meeting. And I said, hey, that's my slide that they're discussing. Oh, wow, they're, you know, people are reading it. And um, then now, you know, that was about two years ago. So now we're getting to the point with um, bigger product launches where people are chasing for updates, you know, whether it's how did we do against the last launch, uh, which countries did better than others, let's say. And um, you know, it's, it's, it's really important just to stay on top of it and everybody's, everybody's interested now, which is, which is quite good. So I think the main thing has just been showing lots of different data, showing analysis, and you know, it's, not everyone is gonna find it interesting and not every metric will work for everyone. But um, it's definitely improving and and evolving quite a lot. Mm. And Rima, you were making some really interesting comments before we, we came out about sort of the the journey that you've seen um, at L'Oreal. Yeah, so I think um, it, obviously when you have such a big corporation, it's quite difficult to move from traditional marketing models into strictly or considering digital metrics. So it's it was really a learning piece for us about how do we get the right tools on board, um, how do we change the, the, the mindset and the frame of people who were working on strictly you know, retail marketing or um, you know, thinking about e-commerce, how are they integrating social data into that. So one of the biggest um, pieces of work that we had to do was first find the right tools because it was hit or miss with some of them and we found that the adoption just wasn't there within the business. But once we cracked that, it was then how do we get everybody upskilled and learning so that they understand how to use the tools. So we're quite lucky because actually our senior leadership teams are all about digital transformation and putting digital first. Mm. So the next big piece to that was how do we connect the social insights into other areas of the business? So not just looking at social in a silo, but thinking, you know, how does this impact our influencer marketing and how influencer marketing impact our general social mentions with customers? Um, you know, does, does the media that we put out have an impact on social mentions? So all things like that, just connecting the different data pieces together really made a difference on how people actually wanted to start seeing a lot more of this data. Yeah, you made a really good point there about the importance of having senior leadership buy-in, especially when it comes to digital transformation. But one of the things I've heard a lot quite recently is this idea of, I guess, teams sort of struggling to figure out how social fits into that broader transformation, how they make it relevant. Mm -hmm. um, did you find that to be relatively easy or was that quite a challenge for you to figure out how we, we take what has traditionally been more of a, as you said, a marketing exercise of reporting historically and transform that into a more agile, um, I guess, program? Yeah, totally. So I think originally it would be, and I'm sure a lot of social managers feel this way, you would be asked to provide a report on how many social media engagements or, or mentions you got and that was kind of the end of the line. So um, we've really seen a movement from our social brand managers and our digital engagement managers of connecting their side of the business to other areas. So actually, we, we drove these social mentions, but we managed to get X amount of clicks to site. So thinking about other areas of e-commerce and the business that we can connect social to. Um, and I think that's when you really start to see change within, a, within an organization where it's not each digital um, area working in silo and actually working together. Mm, absolutely. And I'm kind of bisecting the Lloyd's team here. Um, so I'll let you choose who, who's going to answer it, but I'd be really curious to know sort of a, a more traditional, perhaps overly regulated industry like finance. Um, I know you run quite a, a progressive social media team. Um, it'd be great to hear sort of how that journey has come about um, and, and yeah, where you see that going. Well, going back to when you said about getting it into the business and kind of like the big part is getting it respected as a data source mm -hmm. and getting it, obviously it's new and some more regulated and chicken quite stuck in their ways. I think uh, a way that we found is the infamous, all finance brands are infamously risk averse. Mm -hmm. And a good way we've found of using it is being able to both uh, assess the impact of like risk events or 
on an even more kind of innovative way, preempt them. Mm -hmm. So like, can we see something that's not necessarily gone, like just absolute, I can't even speak on stage, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you just, it's not a, this has happened, it's an absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm. What's the impact? It's using things like triggered alerts, mm -hmm. progressive kind of limits, like thresholds, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, oh, well, it's not a full on breach risk yet, but based on kind of our 12 month average mention volumes, then we can see that this is an actual negative theme that is progressing really strongly. So let's figure out ways, be it from uh, adjusting media spend, adjusting targeting. Uh, the years in with our online customer service team, how can we kind of negate the escalating potential negativity before it becomes a risk? And I think in an innately risk averse environment or company or industry, that's something we can like, oh, actually, it's not this new thing that is completely going to blow traditional out the water and nothing else matters. They can kind of be used in unison. Because mm. there is a, there's an element of trust with the data too, ultimately, right? Like if uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds like that's something you've, you've struggled with uh, and had to overcome, but now have a, a good handle on. A big thing uh, is the way we've improved our uh, tool set around the uh, confidence in sentiment data. Mm. So a big thing that managed that we used personally to gain trust in the reports is the move from machine learning to NLP mm. and being able to uh, that increased uh, the quality of our sentiment output by X percent. Therefore, when you can kind of benchmark that we have like X percent margin of error, X percent confidence level in the thematic analysis of the data we're looking at, they're kind of like, oh, then I actually trust. It's not just, yeah. you don't just sit and play on Facebook all day. <laughs> you actually get good stuff yeah. done. Because that's, that's always the challenge with data science, I think, is, is finding the balance between um, you know, data precision and data recall and getting that level of accuracy, creating that level of trust so you can use it in a more um, productive manner. Um, Matt Adipo, let's, let's go over sort of, uh, do you think that brands are using social media enough? Do you think that there's still opportunities for them to, to grow, and if so, how? Um, do you mean just with analytics or? Um, maybe overall, and then if you, if you have some examples of where you're, you're leading on that, or you feel that you're sure. quite progressive, that'd be a good, good way to tie the two together. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, just, well, when I talk about social media in general, probably we can do better. <laughs> but in terms of analytics and kind of analysis that we do with social data, I think we are quite mature as, as an organization. We do uh, a lot of rigorous analysis. And also, we look at social data not in isolation, but then try and integrate it with other channels. So whether that's other traditional media or digital media and try and look at data in a more holistic way and I think that kind of makes more sense and also like building onto Charlie's earlier point I think it's just it's um, when you talk to a number of stakeholders and also try and get their trust and buy-in into what you're trying to do from a social perspective I think it, it kind of helps when you can validate certain a hypothesis that probably came up from TV ad, for example, mm. or in any other traditional media that they have been using. So I think that that's our, that's our approach has been on how we can use social data to integrate with other media and probably come up with different kind of insights. And um, I'm not sure if a lot of companies are doing that, to be honest. Um, more often than not, probably they are looking into social data and just looking at, like from my experience, I mean, from different case studies and stuff that I have read, I think most of the time people are looking into social data on its own. And to me, that that's not the best way yeah. to look at this. It's about having, I think, multiple data sources brought together, yes. trying to understand the entire voice of the, the customer journey, bringing everything into that singular voice of truth almost, um, so you can find those actionable insights. True, yes. No. That's definitely true. Um, Rima, what about, what about you in terms of um, you know, brands using data enough and uh, sort of that being able to integrate in? in 
I think where one of the biggest opportunities that really lies is the fact that we can now listen to our customers in real time means that we can close the gap in our marketing campaign. So you've launched a new product, um, you're, you've got all your assets ready, they've, they've, they've been deployed, but actually through social listening you can see the day after that there seems to be a gap in knowledge and there's no understanding of how to use the product, for example, or they're not getting on with a certain element of the product. So now because of the real-time data that we get, we're able to say, okay, there's there's something here that our customer hasn't quite figured out, so let's be agile and let's create content that we can push out the following day or the following week that can help educate them. So it's about you know noticing things, not necessarily mistakes, but noticing gaps in your marketing plan and being able to be agile enough because you've listened to any, any, any issues. And we had a recent example actually which was really interesting around a specific palette where customers didn't quite understand how to do the transition. So there was this fear of, you know, is this too advanced for me? Should I, maybe I won't buy it because I won't be able to create enough looks with it. But actually from that, the brands were able to create tons of content, be it with influencers or in-house, um, and push that through to really help the customer understand how to use the product. So, um, you know, before before social insights, we weren't able to do to do that in real time. So it's it's about really increasing the agility, and I think that's a huge opportunity for a lot of brands. How, uh, how easy or difficult was it to put that process in place where, as you said, I think historically people were just mm -hmm. sort of pushing things out, letting them see what happens, and then reflecting back on it after the fact. And now in real time, we have the opportunity to understand that maybe the, the consumer doesn't understand exactly what's happening. We can change the messaging, change the positioning, things like that. Um, how, how easy or challenging is that to implement? I think if I were to answer that a couple of years ago, I'd say quite challenging. I think over the years we've made it a, more of a simple process. Mm. Um, giving, it's all fine to say that we can do this, but unless you give the teams the right tools, um, whether it's the right equipment or access to the right people to be agile, to be able to create that content, um, then, th then it can be tricky. But if you have those elements in place, and it's all test and learn, so obviously you don't know that you're missing that piece until you've got the point, you've gotten to that point and you've got the feedback from the teams and they're saying this is great information but actually I don't have access to a photographer or a camera or a studio to be able to do those things. So um, it, it's definitely a test and learn and I think each business will find where their weaknesses are in, in terms of that workflow but we managed to identify it pretty quickly just, just based on what our customers were telling us to be honest. Mm, absolutely. And Thomas, what sort of shift have you seen internally about how social analytics, I guess, are being used across different teams where maybe they wouldn't have gotten that insight before and maybe they're now seeing what those, you know, this, this could be something I could act upon. Um, I mean, I think overall, I think most companies, I think, see that it's more important to analyze what you're doing on social. So um, even like a coffee truck, for example, might just say, have we been getting a lot of likes? And that's kind of enough for them maybe. Um, whereas other, you know, at the, let's say at the cutting edge, you might have brands watching the Super Bowl ads as it's live and just watching it sort of up to the second maybe or minute. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely becoming more important and, and more brands are realizing there's a lot, there's so much data there. Um, let's do something with it. And so if it's finding strengths and weaknesses, if it's just looking at you and your competitors, you know, how you've done, um, just keeping on top of stories even, you know, whether it might be a crisis for, for some brands or just seeing how certain things in the news affect you or how people say it affects you and you hadn't thought of that. It's, um, it's, quite, it's quite good to get all that data and, and especially in social media. I mean, with let's say a survey, it's really good. You can ask great questions and it, it, you, know, you get the answers back pretty quickly. With social media, you don't even have to ask sometimes you just look and see these people are talking whether you're listening or not and all that information is is there so um, hopefully you can get something useful out of it okay fantastic and that, that's sort of a good point that I, I imagine most people are wondering about sort of what are the the benchmark goals when it comes to measuring social uh, analytics now I think that's largely changed from historically what happened how many hashtags do we get what was the sentiment um, but we would be great to hear sort of what KPIs do you use internally to, to evaluate your, your effectiveness? I mean, up until yesterday, I thought engagements were a good measure of success, <laughs> but uh, yesterday we were told that scrap engagements. Um, no, so we, I mean, in beauty, it's all about brand awareness. Um, we, are, it's such a competitive landscape. 
So for us, it's always about, you know, how do our brands fare generally in the market? Um, and it's no surprise that it's competitive um, within our industry. But also just it, our customers are constant, constantly producing content for us. So a lot of it is to do with the number of mentions, the volume of mentions, um, the engagements we get with that, but not just the engagement. So looking at the richer conversation and understanding if it's positive or negative engagement. So the sentiment is is really very important from a social perspective. And I think another really missed area is understanding cons consumer care side of things. So how, you know, if our customers are coming to us, trying to reach out to us, how are we taking what they're saying? Are we taking learnings from what, what they're saying? Um, and it just always ensures that you're being cu customer centric, which is, mm. is the point of everything we're doing, I suppose. And one of the, I guess, another shift with KPIs is not just looking at broad metrics, but really being able to segment quite detailed. Anything that you can share in terms of how you segment the, the social data a little bit deeper than just here's what, you know, one of our brands did last, last month or what's doing right now? Yeah, I think from a group perspective, obviously, we have so many brands um, that speak to many different people. So it's about understanding the data that's coming through for each brand and addressing that customer. So, you know, do they have interests in yoga and lifestyle or, or are they really interested in makeup tutorials and things like that? So I think with social listening, we're able to understand their interests a lot more. And also, what other things are they discussing in context with our brands? So are they discussing our brand mainly when they're referring to going out out on a Friday night? Or are they discussing our brands when they're doing a Sunday ritual for their skincare? So just understanding how we fit into the whole piece. Um, there was a really interesting talk earlier about the understanding the behaviours of the customer, and I think that's super important. So it's not just necessarily what's trending or what they're mentioning, but what, what are their behaviours and how does our product and our brand fit into their lifestyle? Yeah, absolutely. The idea of looking at different occasions and how people are talking about it or um, different audience segments or anything like that. Um, what about for Lloyds? How, what sort of KPIs resonate most with you internally? Um, net sentiment has to be the top. Okay. And uh, I think we try and contextualise it a bit more with passion. Mm. So um, whether it's like 76% net sentiment, but then what does it actually mean? So mm -hmm. more of like answering the so what kind of questions. So passion definitely is it's quite an interesting layer that kind of help us to contextualise it. And also we try and um, do different kind of analysis around like consumer, customer, media, so those sort of like broad level um, division, so as to say, with, with sentiment. So yeah, I think that, that has to be the key one. Other than that, we also look at images and stuff. As I said earlier, I think um, that, that is something that we are still learning, something new that we have recently started analyzing. <laughs> so that, that has been an interesting lens as in um, how people use different kind of visual medium to talk about the brand. So yeah, I think th those are definitely the key ones. And I believe you use alerts quite a bit to try yes. and understand risk and how it, how it relates. Um, anything you can share a little bit more on that on that front? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we use a lot of like triggered risk alerts and uh, it's uh, like, as Charlie mentioned earlier, it's not just about like risk. Risk management is certainly one of the key things that we do, but it's not always about <coughs> once something has gone wrong, but how can we actually preempt that? How can we actually track that before something goes wrong? And um, like tracking certain level of thresholds with negative sentiment yeah. or like any kind of event that we know may come along. So we can of course try and set something up before something goes live. So yeah, I think we, we use risk alerts a lot with um, like campaigns, our products, any new launch, so yeah, d different kind of things. Okay, awesome. Um, so let's talk about sort of how you build support with key stakeholders who might be unfamiliar um, with what social analytics can deliver. I think, as you said, a lot of people, well, I remember years ago when we were selling it, there was the perception that social analytics or social media is free, so analytics should be free. And now I think that perception has changed where there's quite a bit of uh, financial investment in, in the right tools, the right teams, the right processes. Um, but Thomas, it'd be good to know sort of from your side, any resistance that you encounter from different stakeholders and how you overcome that? Yeah, um, it's, it can be tricky if people haven't really been analyzing much to suddenly um, either have them do it or worse for some people is 
you know, let's say your social media manager, you're, you're producing content, and all of a sudden some new person starts and is telling you, you know, it's not performing that well. Um, you know, you do have to prove why things are working well and help others understand, is it better than last month or the last campaign and so on. Um, but, you know, in terms of showing the effectus, effectiveness, um, I would just start, if someone doesn't really know much about analytics, start with something easy that they, they can understand, like a couple charts, like a dashboard that has some mm. basic metrics, um, or even just a summary. So, for example, they might want to just prove, was this campaign successful? You can say, yes, because this went up, mm. or this was the total reach, for example. Um, something like that is quite easy to understand and share, but then country managers, let's say you've got um, your social media managers in different countries want to know, you know, which posts maybe did the best. Um, overall, is it more engaging? You know, what ha has it been a success and why? Because the main thing is for them to prove to their bosses that they've been doing a good job, so we can help them do that. And if it's if it's my team reporting on what they do or helping them to report it themselves and just keep on top of it in real time, um, you know, there's there's a lot that that can be done. You just have to basically ease people into it. Mm. I think. Absolutely. I think you hit on a, a good point there of um, building momentum. You know, we, we focus on the idea of strategic simplicity. Mm -hmm. Take a couple of key use cases and then build the demand from the inside out. Get people saying, where is this coming from? How do I get more of this? Can I do more with this? Um, and I think you, you've hit on that you know, right on the head because I think that's where you, you build that momentum instead of just trying to implement it. And I think implementation is so key when it comes to social media programs, otherwise it is money just spent that, that sits there. So it's, it's building that interest and that excitement. Um, Rima, what about yourself? I, I find that when you surprise people mm. with the new information, something that they would never have guessed before, that's when they kind of want to know more about what you're doing. So a good example would be recently um, we found out that the conversation around lash extensions, so going into the salon and having lash lifts and lash extensions had actually taken over the conversation around mascara, mm. which is something we never would have guessed within the industry. So it's really interesting to have these tools pick out those insights and say, this is what's happened over the last six months. So, you know, we need to start thinking about how we're marketing and the kind of key terms we're using because actually our customer wants X, Y, Z benefit. And if we're not saying that our products can offer that, then what can we do to do better and, and kind of meet that need? So for me, the adoption is hugely around that piece, around offering a new insight or a new piece of information that maybe they've not heard before that would surprise them. Um, and secondly, just ensuring that the senior management have a view on what you're doing. So not necessarily just saying, you know, here's our dashboard, this is our sentiment, these are the number of mentions, but actually how does that connect to the sales data, the media data mm -hmm. and everything else? So showing the bigger yeah. picture, because it's very easy for social media to stay siloed. And I think if we, as much as we can show the bigger picture of the impact that it's had or the impact that, for example, as I mentioned before, media's had on social mentions, that's where our, our data can get a lot richer. So um, it shows value and it shows that we're not just sitting on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, I think the integration is key. And as yeah. you said, that surprise element is, um, is fun because the way I look at it is 80% of social insights are probably things that you already know and don't care about. 15% mm -hmm. is probably things that you don't know, but once you find out, you still don't care. And it's that 5% that's actually actionable that says, oh, this is something I, I can actually use. And so the question is how quickly and effectively can you get to those insights um, so you can surprise people and, and change behaviors internally. Um, so we're winding down on time now. I want to finish off with a question. If you were to give our audience some advice um, on maximizing the value of social intelligence, what are the, the one or two things that they can take away from our, our talk today? Um, so we'll just head straight down the line. Manadiko, we'll start with you. Uh, for me, the key would be to integrate with other channels. So don't just look at social data in a separate way than you would do any other um, sources of data. So definitely integration is key. Fantastic. I think from our experience, don't, like uh, like Reem was saying, use it for more like in flight stuff, even when it comes to risk, predicting risks, mm -hmm. when it comes to campaigns, kind of in flight rather than wait until a risk has happened or a campaign has ended and being like, it did well or it did atrocious. Mm -hmm. Kind of using it in inherently real time to kind of do it that way rather than a PCA or anything yeah. like that. And that takes, a, that takes a cultural shift internally, right, about how to, to use that. If people are expecting to look at data, oh, we'll figure this out next week. It's a, it seems like a cultural shift to, yeah. to be able to look at that in real time. 
And I think that like many people said, things like triggers yep. and automated exports and that just allows you to, it, it hits your inbox, you get a ping, you get those triggers like it's, oh yeah, I'll check up on it. Yep. Rather than just something you sit up and just runs in, <laughs> get to the campaign, you forget it exists at all. Yeah, absolutely. Rima? Um, I think for me, I, I would have said integrate it into other areas, but um, I'll pick a new one. <laughs> I think one of the, the biggest strengths of social listening is to be able to shed light where we didn't have it before. So if there are dark areas in your business where you think, you know, our senior management has no clue what's happening in this space or that space, particularly as, as I um, mentioned before with the influencer comments, for example. So if nobody knows what's happening with your influencer comments and how things are being received, that's an opportunity to put data where it wasn't before. So um, I think shedding light in new areas would be be my tip. Excellent. Yeah, um, I think for most of us in marketing, the end goal is sales. So the, one of the main things would be just focus on that. So for Huawei, obviously, we want to sell more phones or laptops, wearables, and so on. Um, you know, the marketing insights team wants to make the marketers look good. So we, we need to help them look good to their bosses and show that sales are working or not working and how to improve that. So I think the first thing would be just have, you know, work towards your goal and make sure you're proving it. Um, maybe another thing would just be conversations. So brands are pushing out conversations and we want to know, are people understanding it correctly? But at the same time, consumers are out there talking about us. You know, are we listening to them? Are they asking for one thing and we're giving them something they don't need or they don't want? Mm. Um, you know, it's important to, to to get that conversation going both ways, or realize there are conversations going in both ways that we can that we can track. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's been a really interesting, uh, some really interesting insights from from everyone. So I'd like to thank uh, Thomas, Rima, Charlie, and Manadipa for joining us today. Um, NetBase, our booth is outside. If you'd like to see how we can put some of these uh, real-time analytics and, and uh, make your business more agile, visit our booth. We're happy to show you that in action. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining. Have a lovely afternoon.